Hi, I'm Steve, and I'm here today to talk to you about requirements engineering as interpreted by the ISO IEEE IEC standard 29148-211. Before we talk about the standard, it's important to talk about why requirements gathering is such a critical issue. The British Computer Society produced a study in 2005 which comprised the summary of basically two years, two different years it was summarized to look at the issues of why projects failed. And the common thread in both years, or one of the key common issues, was the lack of clear requirements in requirements management. The Project Management Institute also ran a study. This study was looking at 2,000 practitioners in, in, the, in the field, and they showed that inaccurate requirements gathering was a primary cause of failure, and that actually increased from 32% project failure in 2013 to 37% in 2014. Key issue they found was executive sponsorship for requirements gathering and requirements engineering. The standard itself is quite a mouthful as far as its official title, as shown here. And this standard covers not only the gathering of requirements, but it also provides a, a guidance on managing requirements throughout the software lifecycle, and this applies to system and software products and services. If you wish to purchase this standard, it's about $200, and it's about a 95-page document. Key definitions may be different than you're used to using in your work environment, but again, this is a consortium of people from around the world, and the terms that you use should have equivalence to what's in this document. So the acquirer is the person that's looking to get the product or service. It's a, it's a specific type of stakeholder. There's a concept of operations document this is a very high-level document that describes your, your business organizational environment. Stakeholder is the person with a key interest in this particular piece of software or system that you're designing. The supplier is a person or a group that's producing that particular uh, project. The system operational concept is more at the project level where it spans the business domains and the system domains. And we'll show how these documents relate uh, in a future slide here. Stakeholder requirements needs is the most critical part of the requirements process. So in order to establish that we need to have interdisciplinary skills to develop, analyze, collect these requirements. Part of what we're going to discuss here are the mechanics of how to systematically document those requirements so that they're useful uh, in the detail level of documentation and development. The system operational concept document as we mentioned before, is a very high-level document. This may be uh, commonly uh, used as far as uh, paper models instead of an actual written procedure or document. It's a very high-level uh, document that would be used to help elicit requirements. Once you have requirements, how do you turn them into, uh, once you have needs, how do you turn them into formal requirements? Um, it's easier to think about this when you break the requirements down into three areas. Stakeholder requirements would be the high-level requests that come from the specific end user or someone else that has an interest in the system. The system requirements are the next level down where at the high level, how does the system need to meet these stakeholder requirements? And then when we get down to the system element requirements, those are the 
very small details. Um, if you if you produce your requirement documentation in such a fashion, you won't mix the different requirements together and it's easier to review and validate them. Uh, it's also important to distinguish between attributes and requirements. A requirement is something that translate the stakeholder need into an actual system level or element level um, requirement. The wording of requirements has a very precise meaning and we're going to talk about that in the next slide. Requirements are always mandatory and use the term shall. Statements of fact, declaration of purpose, non-mandatory, non-binding use the term will. Preferences and goals are non-mandatory. They use the term should. Suggestions use the term may. Never use the term must because that gets confused with shall, should, and will, and in some cases uh, leads to a legally binding misinterpretation of a specific requirement. Always use positive statements and active voice when you describe your requirements. Requirements have certain characteristics. They need to be necessary, an essential need. They always talk about what is required, not how to implement. They need to be unambiguous. Only one way they can be interpreted. They shouldn't conflict with other requirements. However, they may depend on other requirements. We'll talk about that later. And they need to be complete, measurable, and describe the actual need. Um, need to be singular, one requirement per line item. Are they feasible? Are, can they be accomplished? And what are the constraints it takes to accomplish them? Are they traceable? Can we trace each requirement back to a stakeholder need or down to a system level implementation? And again, how do we verify that? Uh, does it meet the stakeholder need? Of course, at the project level, it needs to be affordable. It needs to be able to meet the schedule. It needs to be able to meet the regulatory and technical bounds that are that are in the scope of the project. Syntax for documenting requirements can be boiled down into three different types. Not every requirement will fit a singular type of um, syntax. So the idea here, you'll have conditions. You'll have constraints, you'll have a subject, you'll have an action, you'll have a value if something needs to be read or displayed and there will be something, an object that needs to be acted upon. There are always uh, certain assumptions that may go with a, with a requirement that needs to be noted. Uh, assumptions and constraints can sometimes be confused. Constraint is actually something that is specific and limiting. Assumptions will assume states or other uh, aspects of the project that need to be implemented in order for this requirement to be implemented. Attributes are different than the requirements. These describe the requirement. It needs to have a unique ID, needs to have a priority. What are the dependencies? What else does this need to, in order to make it work? What's the risk? Relative scale? Who asked for it? The source? The rationale, why is it needed? Oftentimes we write requirements that we don't remember why we put it in there. The rationale documentation will solve that issue. And then the system element. What part of the system will this affect? Or what parts of the system will this affect? Difficulty is also important. It should be a relative assessment at the time. You don't want to uh, put all your most difficult uh, attributes into the uh, requirements into the last part of your project because your chance of making your project go through is high or is, is risk is high um, and what's the type your organization may have certain types of um, requirements how they classify requirements it's a more open um, um, 
subject line that be defined based on your type of operation. Non-functional requirements include uh, how it, you know, transportability between systems, portability, reusability, reliability, uh, human factors, uh, usability, the illities. There's also uh, a documentation that this requirement should show up in. And in the case of the, the, uh, the, the specification here, it talks about three requirements documents, three different requirements documents. You may have multiple versions of these documents because your system may include multiple subsystems. So you would normally have uh, this, these documents would, would be inclusive of each system or subsystems. So um, we'll talk about them here a little more in the next slide. This is how the documentation goes together. Um, at the high level, you have an external environment. What's the user or the use base that may want this uh, uh, particular product or service? Organizational is internal to your uh, team or your company, depends on how you're structured, uh, how, how this level will be interpreted. And at this place, uh, we'd be gathering the initial requirements. Um, the CONOPS document was mentioned uh, earlier. Here's where, where your organization may have some high-level standards or business practices that would be relative to how, how you would develop a system. And that's unique, uh, again, to your operation, but this is really a very high-level business type of uh, uh, document that should exist outside the project. Um, Project requirements start here at the stakeholder requirements. Uh, here's your first pass at the stakeholder requirements. Then you implement your review process. You exit with a completed set of stakeholder requirements. And that gets you now into the system or the engineering requirements get generated. Um, here's where you're at the more system level operational concept document. Again, this document may need may exist now if you're doing a modification or it may need to be something that needs to be created of how the overall system will function and it spans the business domain and the system domain so it's more of a it's a business level document um, that would be a common reference as you uh, go down more to the uh, system requirements again you have another requirements review process where you generate the system requirements document and at that point, you will know if you have different subsystems that need to be uh, worked on and also documented here in the software requirements documents. Um, so this is how the re requirement documents and processes uh, tail down. The standard covers a lot of other aspects that we're not going to talk about today, and those are listed here. And they deal with configuration management, uh, requirements, ongoing requirements process, requirements analysis. Um, you know, those are topics uh, for another paper. Conclusion, we'd like to say that this is a consortium of industry experts, and it's their opinion of what this believes. It's a starting point. You may not take this document and implement it word for word, but you have a starting point that's generally recognized and recognized internationally. The studies we cited here and many other study, studies will show that lack of requirements is one of the key issues for project failure. It's consistent. It's been consistent no matter what decade you look at uh, these studies in. Um, key key item is always uh, organizational uh, sponsorship, executive sponsorship of the requirements process. Um, this concept, requirements management concept, will apply no matter what method your organization uses to manage projects. You have an agile method, a waterfall method, a rapid application method. You still need to re uh, acquire requirements in a formalized and consistent process that's traceable. So I'd like to thank you for your attention today. Uh, the references I used to create this document are here. Um, the 
international standards is available from various uh, distributors. The studies that I mentioned here are available on the internet for free. And I'd like to also add, uh, I am considering publishing a more formal, more complete document in here. So if you're interested in further reading, you can look for that sometime in 2019 on Amazon. Thank you for your time today.